Hello, ladies. Oh, it's only you. Hello, Emily. Hello. Are you ready to present? More or less, yes. Yeah. How are you? Good, good. I'm this is this is my last one of the day. So. Oh wow. How's it been? It's been very good. I've been working at it since 6 45 this morning. Whoa, amazing. I, I'm very excited to hear your panel, though. I think this is going to be very good. Same. Um, yeah, it's like it's going to be a great host of, of people. Hopefully they can get in. Yeah, so, I, I, um, should I be letting people in? Let me just. Are we, did you hit start webinar? I did, yes. Okay, so we are live now. So people will start trickling in as well. So let's okay, sure. People are already here, which is good. That's all right. That gives them a little bit more time to get in. But we'll just wait for our other two panelists because there are just two now. So, have you been able to take in any of the presentations today? You know, I, I work at the British Museum in London and I've, I've just, I've cycled here in a mad fury because I had a big event um, this evening for our community partners. Uh, so we have, uh, Stonehenge exhibition on at the moment and feminine power so we open that up to our community guests and um, the rest of the museum is closed it's really intimate it's really lovely but um, so yeah I was sort of finished that and was on the bike like racing to get back but so unfortunately I was there all day um, so I couldn't actually annoyingly kind of be involved in the others but they went well are you pleased Yes, everything's gone very well. And the beauty is you will always have the recording, just like all of our, our attendance members today, they will be able to see um, all of the presentations. Oh, so fantastic. That's, that's brilliant. We're just looking to see where are other two. I think Caroline must just be finishing hers and cool. whatever, not be too far behind. Um, because you've, you've started the session, um, you're in, in charge of that right now. If you can right click me and make me the host, then I yes. can handle all the administration pieces for our audiences when it comes to question time. Okay, so if I make you the host. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, you just, so we're under participant, yes, there you go. Perfect. Ooh, then we're all set up. I, people are rolling in. Hello, audience. Yeah, nobody wants to say hello now, but that's all right. <laughs> There's Caroline. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? How did your talk go? Uh, I don't know. Oh. Okay. I hope well. I couldn't see the chat. I couldn't see any questions. And I apparently ran over. And so I didn't get to anyone oh. to talk to me. So I, I I don't know. I hope people enjoyed okay. it. Karen, after Hi. party. Hello, everyone. Hi. So I will tell you right off the bat, we are already live, so I'm just Oh, hi. That. So our, your audience is here, and because you're all here now, I'm going to get you started right away. Hello, and welcome to our last panel of the day. What is the most international food? I am super excited to hear what you guys have to say. It's going to be incredible. I am Bree. I'm your admin for this session, so I'll be disappearing off screen, but I will be here if you're having trouble in the chat, if you can't see anything. If you have questions for our panelists, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature or put it in the chat and I will ask them when the time comes. But with that in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce Greta Hardin, Caroline Varenkamp, and Emerlene Smee. Smee. Yeah. Smee. And I will let you ladies take it away. All right, so first of all, I have to just say hi to my panelists. This is the first time we've all been together. I'm so excited to see you guys in person. I was so flattered when I was like, um, so there's this thing, would you do it with me? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, Deb Freeman won't be joining us. She had a family emergency and I was like, no. super, yeah, I was super excited to, to meet her in person too. So anyway, so hello everyone. For those of you who have not seen me elsewhere, um, I host the podcast, The History of American Food. I just finished up the 17th century. I've started in the 18th century. It has gotten 
way more complicated and I yeah. love it. <laughs> awesome. Your gumbo um, presentation was amazing. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and so since this, you know, is an international event, I wanted to get an international cast. So I am so glad that you joined me. So Emmerline, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. And my name is Emmeline Smy. I'm host of the Smy Goodness podcast, which looks at where food history uh, and food art meets. I focus on an ingredient and then how it's traveled the world and then also how it's been depicted throughout time and history, uh, focusing on, on under and misrepresented artists. So my background is archaeology. I also work at, in museums. I work at the British Museum. I've just like cycled back on my bike from a big event I had there this evening. Um, but yeah, that's my passion is sort of communities, people, food, all of that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. And Caroline, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I host Wonders of the World. So we uh, it's, I use the great places on earth to tell the story of our people, our civilization, our planet. And the podcast is kind of like 50% history, 40% travel and 10% food. Because I find the best way to understand a place is to understand the food of the people who eat, you know, were there and understanding the cuisine. And so every episode I do a local recipe um, and kind of talk through what makes it special and unique about that place and, you know, as most respect as possible. So, um, you know, have episodes everywhere from Ethiopia to Peru to, um, well, I'll eventually get to North America. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I've just had, I'm about to do the Mexican conquest. So I guess I have plenty of Mexican episodes already with the Aztecs and the, and the Maya, um, India, China, every, you name it, right? And um, so it's really cool to be part of this because it's not, you know, food is, I just love it. <laughs> okay, so I pulled together this panel because um, of an experience I had as a kid. Um, my parents are both from the Southeast. My mom's from Tennessee, my dad's from Georgia. So of course I read Gone with the Wind when I was in middle school and there was this whole big deal made about ice cream. And I was just sitting there thinking about like what it took to make ice cream in the 19th century. And I didn't go that deep then, but I was like, okay, well, so they had to get sugar and they had to have cows. And if they made chocolate ice cream and I, I was just like, oh my God, is chocolate ice cream the most international food? I, I don't think it is anymore, but <laughs> that was the first time this idea struck me. But the more I thought about this topic, I'm like, there's a lot of ways you could answer that question. So again, I wanted, I wanted to get a variety of people to hopefully hear kind of how you thought about that question and what you came up with. So Emmerline, take it away. Right. I'm so excited as well to hear what everyone has, you know, been thinking. And um, so should I start with what, what my entry into the international food? Yeah, was? go for it. Yeah. yeah so for me, it's one near and dear to my heart, but I chose pancake, the pancake, as my most international food. And that being for a multitude of reasons, I have a you know close connection where my mum would always make pancakes on, you know, on, on the weekend. It was like that treat. Even um, you know, I'm going to America on Monday and I haven't been in three years with pandemic and everything. And, um, you know, sort of brunch culture and breakfast culture in America is like much bigger than it is in the UK. And so, you know, it, but then beyond that, it's just sort of the, the ancient history of it and that every culture, you know, has their own version of um, a sweet or savory pancake of different ingredients. And, you know, I, I do a lot of workshops with people, you know, in, in London, we have people from all over the world as, as there is everywhere, but, um, I do a lot of workshops with with families and, and women and so pancakes is a, is a session that I often do and ask people you know what's the pancake you know and you, you get so many different you know amazing selections from you know I've got a list here because there's there's so many but just some of my favorites are you know there's like the black eyed bean pancake the akara from West Africa you've got your dosa you've got your crab you've got a kasira kicha um, you know, the fluffier pancake of America, 
uh, a gozleme, uh, the okonomiyaki, the Mexican tortilla. And it's just, you know, I, I, I just love that you, you take a bit of these simple ingredients and this is something our, you know, prehistoric ancestors would have been doing way before the organized religion that's around, you know, some of the traditions we have around Lent and fasting a, a across multitude of cultures. But yeah, I just, uh, I love eating pancakes. I love making pancakes. I love sharing pancakes. Um, you know, pancake day here, you know, to mark, um, you know, Lent is, is big and it's big around the world. And so I just, I, I love the tradition of it. I love the simplicity of the ingredients, but then I love any food where you can kind of have these simple ingredients, but then it takes on this whole life of its own. So um, that was the, that was what I chose. Very cool. <laughs> I'm laughing at pancakes as I ended up taking my, my kid to Amsterdam when he was pretty little. And I was like, this will be the best country to take a kid to. And I was right. But for other reasons I didn't realize. I'm like, <laughs> we can get pancakes for every meal. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Sweet, savory, you know, fantastic. So that was that was my, uh, and I can't wait to hear everyone else's. Yeah. Yeah. So Caroline, I want to hear what so your- So I, I took a totally different approach to this. So I was thinking <laughs> more about from an ingredient standpoint, right? What kind of ingredient has traveled the most? right? Where we now feel like it's a, an essential part of so many cuisines, but it, it wasn't originally. And, you know, I, I thought about things like, you know, rice is everywhere and how far that spread. And I thought about things, you know, others, but the one that really is near and dear to my heart is the little chili pepper. Yay! <laughs> that the chili pepper, this little, this little, little nugget from Mexico, this little capsaicin inducing heat, face melting pepper has been so essential to so much of the world's cuisine and only in the last couple, you know, 500 years, right? I mean, that to me is a, amazing too, right? How much it has spread to become just assumed to be part of these nation's cuisines, just being spread by the Portuguese or the Spanish, you know, and, 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 and just think, they're thinking like, this is amazing. It makes me cry and hurt and I need you to try it. That's phenomenal. And I love that. But think about, you can't have Hungarian food without paprika. It comes from, you cannot have um, the, the Thai food without the bird's eye chili. It comes from Mexico. You can't have Mozambican food right? You can't have, um, it, it, it's an essential part of, of everything from Brazil to Louisiana. It's an essential part of South in, uh, Italian cooking, Indian cooking, uh, Chinese cooking, right? You can't have without, without uh, how can you have Kung Pao chicken without having the spicy peppers? And they immediately have the Szechuan peppercorns too, so that's a different thing. It's just, there's so much that this one little ingredient has spread across the world and been adopted by so many. And it's, it hurts you, right? That's the thing. It isn't like, it isn't like comfort food, like the onion has become or garlic or tomatoes, right? Or a good starch or dumplings, which someone mentions in the chat, which is a brilliant choice. Oh my God, dumplings are an amazing choice. This is a, an ingredient that causes pain but we love it. I just find that to be the most amazing thing in the world. Can I say that Chili's was my second choice? And I, I because I, I completely agree. I, I make chili, I make chili jams, I make hot sauce, and it is just fascinating how everyone claims a, a sauce or an ingredient as their own. And, and as you say, sort of, it's, it's so recent that it's been brought across the world through multitude of travel, you know, slave trade. Um, it, it's just, it's it's gotten to every corner of the earth and I, I love that and it, and it is painful and, and making hot sauce and chili jam and sometimes forgetting to wear like double gloves. Oh my God. I have like throbbing hands. Uh, oh, and then you make the mistake cool. of like rubbing your eyes and you're doomed forever. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so I, 
since Deb's not here, I thought I would toss in um, mine. And again, for an earlier thing, I was also thinking about chili, but I stumbled on the potato. It's a good choice. Because, because like chili is everywhere. Um, and I just learned about Nando's chicken from South Africa and I like have to like get into that and find out about that. But because that goes with the peri peri pepper. Right. But and that's Mozambican. That's Mozambican originally. Yeah. And the South Africans took it from Mozambique, which is that's got a whole story. I mean, Mozambican cuisine is <laughs> that's a whole nother world. It is amazing. So, yeah, no, that's cool. Right. <laughs> um, so but I was like, but uh, for the most part, peppers have kind of the same role wherever they go. Right. Um, where they've been made into a mild pepper, they're more like a vegetable. Um, and that's its own story. But potatoes get transformed and made, they like, it like blends into these countries and it's transformed by each, each cuisine. So you sort of think about like, you know, there's more of like the, the mashed potato aspect to like say Irish um, or, you know, a lot of kind of how it's used in croquettes and stuff in a lot of Europe. Um, but in China, there's a Sichuan dish, which is great, like thick grated potatoes that's sort of fried and put in this vinegar. And I was like, ha, wait, this, <laughs> this is like nothing I've ever seen. Or you sort of have the whole like shredded potato pancake tradition, or, you know, you have, you know, using like potato dough. Um, I just like... I sort yeah. of realizing that the potato or vodka, <laughs> right? I mean, the potato has been transformed. It transforms every culture it goes into and the culture transforms the potato. Right. I mean, you see in the comments, right? So you have even just in a small radius in Europe, you have, um, you have everything from the tortilla española, right? Which is very potato-y Spanish dish to gnocchi right? Yeah. Potato pasta pop, you know, pockets in Italy to the Belgian frite, which is the epitome of the potato. Mm. And all of it, because it came from Peru, right? Which is, I mean, Peruvian potatoes will blow your mind. Yeah. Go to Lima or Cusco and get like the, the variety of, the variety of them. Yeah. it's unbelievable. It's just so much because we're so used to just the few things, right? We're so used to the homogenization of some of these ingredients, right? In, in Western culture, we, you get to Peru and there's 200 kinds of potatoes. So it's lying around and yeah. it's amazing the things they can do with it, um, including the, this purple potato, I think it's chicha, chicha morado. They make it into a drink which is actually kind of similar to horchata in Mexico, which is like a rice-based um, kind of pulpy, creamy drink. But the, the chicha morado is, it's phenomenal. You wouldn't think like purple potatoes would make a drink that would actually be refreshing at high altitudes. It's, a <laughs> it's amazing. Um, it's just like, just slightly sweet enough. It's just slightly potato-y enough. It's just slightly purpley enough. It's, it's, a, it's, it's hard to define, honestly, but it's, again, it's the diversity of that you can do with the potatoes. Such a great point. Uh, it's it's amazing. I love as well how potatoes, you know, when they sort of came, were brought to Europe, you know, and, and so many of these ingredients sort of looked at, um, you know, with uncertainty that have now become such incredible staples, uh, you know, that we really could struggle, would struggle to think of not having them uh, in our cuisines and everyday, Literal staples, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. We know we did. We they, it came out with this topic, right? This conference topic of the crossings, and I thought I had just done an episode on Columbus and the Columbus Columbian Exchange, right? And I thought, well, surely someone will cover that better than I could do, and nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have an episode <laughs> on Columbian Exchange. I mean, you had the, the gum episode was great. I just assumed we'd have somebody would cover that, and so it's nice that we can talk about it a little bit here. Hmm. I, I think I think the the Columbus uh, Columbia Exchange was in the balloon debate, but that was like that much. But everybody's like, ah, oh, that's been so done. I know, okay. but still. So <laughs> I'm now now that we've sort of talked about what we think of as the most international food, 
the question is what what's something <laughs> that you're like this should be the next breakout star something that you've run across oh that's tricky like the oh. Oh. so while while you guys have time to think um I am intensely interested these days in dry land rice because I'm sneaking up on the first introduction of rice into North America. And that was African rice, not Asian rice, but it was abandoned because the cultivar that they were dealing with was like too fragile and took all of this very specialized sort of husking and hulling and preparation. And yet it was this luxury product that was exported from Carolina to Europe. Um, and again, I have to go down this, like follow this up, but the mythology is, is that the strain that was introduced into Carolina came from Madagascar, which is entirely, entirely possible because um, in my pirate episode, I learned there isn't just like the classical triangle trade. that's right. like, um, sugar and you know captive africans and rum there was a secondary loop that was new york to madeira to madagascar and i was like wait what so a whole bunch of the northern slaves in early america were actually malagasy not from the west coast of africa wow so I'm going to be interested to see how dry land rice is reincorporated into the rice conversation because of all of these changes in weather. That's fascinating, yeah. Caroline, can you? <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am flummoxed, right? Because I'm trying to think like the you next do. big thing. And I'm like, I, so. I have my go-to, I keep, I'm always banging. I keep, I keep waiting for Ethiopian to break out because I love Ethiopian food and I love the sourness of the injera and I love the, the massive level of flavor profiles that you get with the Doro Wat and you get the, 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 the different, all the different the, your dishes you have, right? You get these, these stews, they stick them on the injera and you just, you eat with your hands and it's amazing, right? But it's, you know, and it's so often, so much of it's vegan friendly, and I keep thinking that in a world where we're looking for delicious vegetarian options that aren't like fake chicken fingers, right? Or fake meat that we're, you can actually have delicious vegetables and you can have delicious meats and you can have them in separate places and you can do it right in a way that is delicious for everyone. I keep thinking Ethiopian has got to hit, yeah. but it never does. And, um, and I, I don't know. I just, I love it so much and I admire the culture so much. And I just want that to be a thing, even if it's just like, just wanting it. <laughs> we're, we're, so, we're, we're so spoiled in, in London with such amazing cuisine, even though we have a bad reputation, you know, amongst some people as like, you know, being this food desert, but there's so many cultures here you, you can kind oh, of- Oh no, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, we're really spoiled for, you know, access to, to that. I've just had a brainstorm and it's something I've tried really recently. Okay. In that I've ventured out in this year into doing my own kombucha and gotten like bit too, bit very well into it. A friend gave me a scoby. And so it's just, you know, if you've made your own kombucha, it's really quickly you start having these scoby. And I just always feel, A, they feel a bit, you know, it's, it's a bit alien-esque. It's a bit um, strange, these like rubbery creatures that just form every time you make a, kombucha but um last week I just you know started thinking I just I can't throw another scoby away and let me just do some googling and so I have I will admit it I have started cooking my scobies so just for people who aren't sort of like deep sure. into the kombucha world yeah, do you want to explain no, I, kind of what a no, scoby no, is no, and what you're talking what you're about because I know <laughs> But I bet a lot of other people don't yeah, know. So your scoby, and again, I'm very new to it, but your scoby is sort of the live culture, I guess, that um, you're basically feeding that a sugar and in my, in my case, a tea blend. So I, you know, every time I make a batch of scoby, you, you start with a, a, a batch of kombucha, 
you start with the SCOBY starter, which is alive essentially. And so you're trying to keep it alive and you kind of feed it tea and sugar. And so it, it feeds off the sugar and you have this fermentation process essentially. And so then you get, a, a you know, you have sort of two stages of fermentation and you get a, a slightly effervescent drink. It tastes a bit like vinegar. Um, it, it's got, you know, it's meant to have health benefits. It's uh, it's very delicious. I, I, I like a, you know, a, it's, it almost tastes like a, a vinegar. That's not really selling it, but but you can, I've made an elderly. It's a shrub. Brand. It exactly. tastes like a shrub. It tastes well, like a okay. Shrub. That's not selling it either. <laughs> oh, well, if you don't know what a shrub is, my goodness. Um, no, so. Oh, I thought I you meant like an actual, yeah. No. Um, no, no, I know you, I, I know you mean now. Yeah, but still. Yeah. So still. I just wanted to, um, let's see. Uh, I just wanted to, so, to pull that out a little bit more. So SCOBY stands for symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And so, yes, Yum. it's sort of like making extremely fancy farmhouse beer because all those like super fancy like farmhouse okay, beers yeah. have the yeast to digest the sugar. And so that's what's yeah. happening. And then you have the bacteria that is sort of digesting the alcohol and some of that other stuff. And that's where you get all of those like vinegary fruity flavors. And so when I'm talking about a shrub, these are these, um, these drinks that were sort of made with like vinegar and fruit vinegars and sugar. And they were either used as an alternative to alcohol or they were mix they were mixers for alcohol. It sort of depended on where you were on that. But that's really interesting because these very lightly alcoholic drinks are another extremely international constant. Oh. So, so you think about um, in South and Central America, the, I think it's called cachaca. Mm -hmm. It's the it's like gently fermented corn beers that they have. Oh, it's chicha. Chicha, it's chicha. thank chicha. you. Chicha and boot. is a, is a chachaza is a, 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 a sugar-based rum right in essence right okay from brazil but, but, but yeah the but chicha like africa, the chicha morada with the potatoes yeah yeah and then in africa you have all of the millet beers and mm -hmm. the different grain beers that are more like these porridgey things so they're like super nourishing but they're also this celebratory thing and they have these great like carvings and things of people drinking out of like these crazy straws made out of reeds <laughs> at these parties and yeah. then you think about like there's these sort of millet rice beers in um in asia <laughs> that were and they figured out ways some of those are actually made with bacteria cultures or fungal cultures rather than yeast which I didn't know. <laughs> so there's like multiple ways to ferment your grain stuff and make your beer. Yeah, so, in America, we have Budweiser. So same concept. Yeah, and yeah, and that's corn and rice. <laughs> lousy, lousy, poorly, <laughs> not very alcoholic -like beer. <laughs> I'll, I'll just um, say re regarding my SCOBY cooking adventures that it does have, um, you know, I've been dicing it and then you can kind of lightly fry it and, it has like a texture of almost like a lardon, but it's, you know, it's totally, you know, it's, it's no animal product, but it has a really interesting texture, but you can kind of, you can blitz it and add it to smoothies. You can, you can do all sorts of it on sorts of things with it. I'm, I'm discovering, but I, I just think it's one of those things as well, rather than kind of wasting it. And I, ha I already have, you know, the, the SCOBY hotel and trying to give it to friends, but um yeah, so I'm really intrigued by that. And that's the latest thing that I'm going to be looking a bit more into is sort of like, how can I use these scobies to, it's sort of like the, the jams and chutneys and, you know, sauces that I make. It's sort of, how can I kind of zhuzh something up and like throw it back in to the mix and rather than just, you know, throwing my poor little scobies away, um, you know, kind of eating them. But yeah. this is the first yeah. time I've been admitting this in public. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so one I mean, of the I'm grossed craziest... out, but it sounds like it could be good. <laughs> but well, it's it's like an, it's a mushroom, basically, you know, sort of like yeah. eating a woodier mushroom or something. But the craziest thing I've ever seen anybody do with scobies is they dry it and sort of use it as a leather. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just an exhibition the other day and they were <laughs> doing that as well. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The technologies and, and whatnot. Um, for like making like wallets and I even somebody saw somebody who made like a, there was a question from Brian who they made like a jacket out of scoby leather. <laughs> they said it was a little fragile the way that they did it, but. That's my That's name. a lot of kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Well, how often, so how often do you have a new scoby each time? I, it's really strange. And then basically I make a, I make sort of three gallons a week. Um, and then I, like last week I was making elderflower. I picked some elderflower. So I have a batch of elderflower um, kombucha on the go. And so once a week I make the kombucha. And so it just, it just really forms quickly and you can kind of have different layers, but then eventually it gets so thick, you sort of peel off, you know, the older layer. And then, yeah, I have a scoby hotel now. It's like a whole, it's like a whole new responsibility in my life. But, um, but then even sometimes in the second fermentation, once you put it in the fridge, you will get a mini, like a baby scoby on the top of that bottle, um, which it kind of stops fermentation, but it's, it's still sort of, you get a very thin layer, which those ones I do just generally put in the compost, but, um, but yeah, I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's, and it's, you know, it's like a nice little effervescent drink you know, rather, you know, I make mine out of green tea rather than, it's like something else to drink besides green tea, basically. <laughs> it is a bit like so, sour and starter. It's got a whole life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're we're kind of getting to the point where I do want to start to take some more questions yes, from the audience. Yes, please, please, please. So, Brad. I'm, I'm going to start you off with um, a question based on what you're talking about, climate change and the importance of how that's going to change our food. What about food behaviors that are international? Like, oh, could we make a commentary on foraging and, and the foraging movement? How will that impact food internationality or will it do the opposite? Ooh, ha, huh. I, I hadn't even thought about food behaviors. Um, I, I do think with foraging, that's sort of this first the first step to sort of realizing like, if I had to feed myself from where I lived, how, how in trouble would I be? <laughs> Super in trouble. But there is a whole movement around foraging now. And, and even though it, it sort of hyper localizes your experience with food, it's still a very international behavior. And perhaps there's, there's something to be, to learn there about how we internationally interact with food. Yeah, I mean, is there a movement about foraging? Like, I haven't heard of this, but maybe I'm in the wrong place. I mean, in, I'm in Indiana, right? I, all we have is corn. So I'll be eating corn forever, which has lots of value, I guess. I mean, you can do things with corn. I could make grits. Um, and being from, I, I'm from sort of the countryside in, in, in like a very rural part of England in sort of the east, east of England. So there is that sort of very, deep connection to the surrounding and you you kind of forage you know I have lots of my jams and chutneys sort of like from slows to elderflower that I got last week to you know cherries and plums like you can kind of get that and then also you can go to sort of more like commercial farms but where you can kind of pick pick your own but I think um yeah I know it's the case all over the world that everyone's sort of concerned about you know, food supply chains and cost of everything. So it is something I'm constantly thinking about of, you know, stocking up my own preserves, you know, my own larger, if you will, to, to have some of these things to sort of help supplement it. And then, and, but there's, there's so much to think about. It is like sort of where you're, where you're located and yeah. what you have access to. And it's sort of, it's kind of a very privileged thing in a way um, to be able to sort of, to, to, to do that and um, I, you know I know there's a lot of foraging groups in, in London where you know you pay sort of 200 pounds and you go you know foraging in the countryside and you know yeah. you the mushrooms and it's sort of you know where you know it, it, it's it's really super interesting. Mm -hmm. You, you I mean, try that in Indiana you're gonna get shot like. Yeah. I was gonna say best case scenario maybe people start to say, okay, so we're growing corn in Indiana, but what else is also going around around the corn? Like, what are the weeds that grow? What are the animals that live there? What are, like, they start looking at 
the landscape as you know the whole biosphere things that you know gosh i wish they'd do that but worst case scenario you know yeah everybody decides they have to move to the central valley of california i don't know <laughs> yeah um, in fact, um, quite a, a large like foraging movement on TikTok, and and they're all set in like Central Ohio, which you wouldn't necessarily think is as as food diversity, but very interesting. So, um, Any, go ahead. I was gonna say. So, other questions? Yes, uh, Luke had a question for you, which was, can you think of what the most international dish with uh, could be with ingredients from? the furthest around the world. So like in one dish, what has the most international ingredients? That's a really good question. I mean, I immediately think of the of of gumbo, right? Which which you had that great presentation on earlier. Like just looking at that map that you showed, but all these ingredients came in and the impact of Africa and Europe and South America and North America all kind of coming together for these this amazing dish. Um, that would be where my head would initially go. And then I, I, I probably start thinking of, I probably start thinking of things in, in China, on, in, in Cantonese cooking, where there's so much that came from, again, the Americas and from Europe and even from as far away as Africa and India to influence the flavors there. Um, I mean, I think you just, I, I, my head goes to coastal food mostly. I think a lot about as well, um, Italy, you know, there's so many foods that are known and thought to be authentically Italian that are reliant on, you know, foods from the Americas, uh, foods, you know, in ingredients from all over. And then, you you know, you have so much variety within the Italian kitchen um, regionally in itself. And uh, yeah, I, I love that example. And that, you know, even, even with like pizza, you sort of think, well, yeah, that's another one that's like super recent. And yet we, it's so hard to disassociate it from, from Italy. Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at Luke. I wanna see this um, gumbo map. It's amazing. When, when we get to the, the, after, the after chat, I will bust that back out. I had so much for making that. But because this, I had this on my brain when I flew to Georgia, cause I do family business stuff there. I got a, Mexicano mocha. So it was coffee from Africa, chocolate from South America, dairy from Europe, and and then because there was cinnamon and some other spices, so spices from sort of the Indian Ocean cluster. And I was like, it is insane that I can pay seven bucks. It is, it is an airport mocha. Um, <laughs> And I have the entire world in my hand. And, and I was like, this is the most international breakfast I think I've ever had. <laughs> That's such a good point, right? I mean, you think about, I mean, I think about vanilla, right? How vanilla, it, we think of vanilla as being, we use it as an adjective for boring. And it is the least boring thing in the world. And we need orchid. to bring back rose water. Bring back rose water. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I mean, think about vanilla, right? It's a little orchid growing in the Madagascar jungle that has to be hand-picked and has the most subtle flavor that it just, it is beyond compare. And yet we have normalized it so much that we use it as a synonym for boring. And yet... It has it is so challenging to grow. It is so or so few places you can grow it. There's it's so expensive to to get. We have to use fake vanilla on almost everything we we think of as vanilla. It's um I just it, I just find that something really amazing. But you we think of it you know just like a vanilla syrup in my coffee and my latte, and yeah we're getting all these things from all over the world coming together and this magical flower from Madagascar that ties it all together. It's amazing. Yeah. Are there any other questions for our panelists? We have five minutes left before we have to hard stop them. So if you have anything, type it in the chat now. Are there any other foods that you feel are vastly underrated in that way that vanilla is that deserve far more attention for how extraordinary they are? I love turmeric. I will bang on about turmeric all day if you let me. Um, you know, I, I use it topically on my 
busted ankles. I have it in smoothies. Like I freshly grated cooking, you know, it's, it's oh, okay. How, how is the flavor of fresh turmeric, which I've only seen and never cooked with compared to the dry stuff? Like how, I think it's a little, in, in my opinion, it's a little bit more fiery. You have that sort of the rootness of it, you know, like like similar to where you have the, the fresh ginger. Yeah. Really kind of like coming through clean. It's like the liquid um, aspect of it. Um, besides it, like completely staining your fingers, it's like totally worth it. But <laughs> I, you know, I, I really believe in, the, you know, like the heat, you know, without sounding whatever but like the healing properties of it I, I definitely do feel a difference but even just that combined with vinegar vinegar sorry with ginger kind of thrown into a dish it just takes it to that next level but it has that distinctive you know it's again it's another dish that's so integral in, in so many cookery you know curries and um it's like a harmonizer um, yeah. but yeah also I, apparently just as effective in dry form you know and um you know I, I like it as a tea I, I like it as, as a as a spice as an ingredient um yeah that's one of mine yeah. I mean I've had better luck with my cancer without turmeric than I had with turmeric wow like turmeric actually caused the tumors to grow and when I stopped it they stopped but wow. um yeah so turmeric's on my bad list but um it's still really tasty <laughs> It still has so much value as a flavor profile. I love the point that somebody mentioned in the chat, pepper. Yeah. Now, black pepper is In fact, I would love amazing. to bring back all of these spices we used to use before we had chili peppers, because there wasn't just black pepper. There was long pepper, which was like this, or it was also known as African pepper or grains of paradise. Like we need to Grains of paradise are amazing. Yeah, we need to remember white pepper. We need to remember cubeb. And just like all of these, uh, this like whole galaxy of spicy stuff that has just been like, well, now we have chilies and black pepper. Yeah. We don't need all of this stuff. I love mace as well. Um, <sighs> Oh, interesting. Uh, so, discovering that mace, nutmeg, and cloves were like just on one little island each in the Indian Ocean. And then the relative of cloves, allspice, was in the Caribbean. Like, huh? Does that happen? That, was that and alien? Allspice. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> allspice. Ah. Can't have it without, can't have jerk chicken without it. No. Um, okay. Anybody, anybody else have a question before we run out of time here? We're in our last minute here. So let's take maybe the opportunity to wrap up and say thank you so much, ladies, for your incredible conversation about food, internationality, and all that connects us. And I thought it was fabulous. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for our, to our audiences and if you want to continue this conversation, the breakout room still exists and will exist until it starts the after party. So, <laughs> uh, but it was so nice to get to talk to you and yes. see you and and hear from you. And we'll have to do some more stuff. <laughs> yeah, this has been a blast. Super fun. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Lovely to speak oh. meet to you all and in, in internet person. I may actually have to try kombucha. I may have to give that another shot. Yeah. I thought it was super gross when I tried it, but I may try it again. Me I'm too. I, to, I, I never liked it until I started making my own. I think it tastes better when you make your own. It probably does. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>